Good morning, Open Christ Church. It's great to be in the house of the Lord today. Have you ever noticed the, uh, the high priority prayer has in the Bible? Um, it's just, uh, there's just so many, so many prayers through the Old and New Testament. You know, and they're about praise and worship, thanksgiving, confession, supplication, which is humbly asking the Lord for things that you need, um, and petition too, which is praying for others. And, and we do all these things at, at, at uh, Hope in Christ Church. Um, through our through our prayer list, through our prayer team. Um, also, um, I don't know if you know that the, all recorded revivals in history had the beginnings in prayer, uh, which is a pretty good statement on you know a good reason for us to pray, pray as a church. Um, sometimes you know we don't know what to pray. Sometimes there are some real difficult situations in life. It's like you just you don't know how to approach it. Um, and I've been in a situation a few times in my life. Um, and um, so basically, uh, if you go to Romans 8.26, it says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And in verse 27, backs it up and says, The Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So in difficult times, like Jesus did in the garden, he, he just asked, you know, Lord, you know, let, let your will be done. And sometimes in our prayers we have to do that too. we just got to give it over to the Lord. Um, it's just something that uh, is comforting um, when we get to that point um, when we're really, in, you know, going through these very difficult situations in our lives. Um, in Ephesians 1, Paul prays uh, for knowledge and understanding. Um, of course, when we read um, God's word, coupled with prayer, of course, uh, you know, we gain wisdom, which gives us discernment. Um, so um, a- as we read God's word um, and you pray with that, we get, we get wisdom. And through that, we can make good biblical, sound biblical decisions on uh, you know, things for our families, our lives, our businesses, um, whatever it is we're doing. Um, so it's, it's really good practice. To, uh, to pray and, and read God's word and you know, ask for, for knowledge and understanding like, like Paul does. Of course, now we have, we have the, you know, the Bible and prayer, so we do have access to knowledge and wisdom. So um, just, just a bit of encouragement there, I guess. Um, the Bible also commands us to pray in Philippians 4, 6. It says, uh, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So are there any praises that uh, you have for us today you want to share with us? Yes, Stella. Um, a couple things. Kind of as a thank you to the men's group Wednesday night for building that uh, Wednesday night group. Um, Great. Praise the Lord, we are starting on Wednesday, it's been a long process, but we are starting, and the younger kids are going to have an outlet Wednesday night, um, and again, I want to I thank Lori for helping sort things out from the different places that were around the church that the Awana stuff was Wednesday night, um, so, but Awana is starting, praise the Lord, for the, little, for the younger children. So there's a praise for uh, the, the 30, the men's group uh, helped assemble a cabinet for uh, the Iwana group, um, as well as uh, just praise for, for the Iwana starting up this week. Any others? Yes, Rita. Okay, Stella's uh, uh, giving praise for all the prayers and uh, and the help that she had um, through difficult times with uh, with Floyd's brother uh, passing this week. So. What else? Okay, 
Um, there must be some prayer requests, though. How about some prayer requests? Yes. Um, as you guys, um, we were praying for my, my mom um, a while back. Um, I was at the kids' church. And I brought up my mom, but um, she was having a um, biopsy uh, on her on her tongue, um, and she he wasn't sure what it is. But it's Tuesday, um, so please lift her up in prayer um, about that. Okay. So. And her name is Denise. Who is it? Her name is Denise. Vivian? No, Denise. Denise, I'm sorry. Denise. So, Denise, uh, we need to pray, pray Denise for uh, so a medical procedure this week and for a spiritual uplifting as well for Denise. What else? Okay, the pastor did uh, send an email um, yesterday. Um, his and Shirley's niece, Brooke, um, was admitted to the ER yesterday for COVID. Um, and she's, uh, she's very sick, apparently, and scared as well. Her father passed away in July from COVID. So we'll lift up um, Brooke in our prayers as well. Um, I'd like to lift up Iwana and the Iwana team, just starting off. Um, Satan has a way of uh, working his way into our ministries and trying to mess up the works and all kinds of weird distractions that may happen, but uh, we'll pray that that uh, goes off without a hitch and the Lord blesses that. And I'd like to also add all of our ministries in this church that uh, the Lord will watch over us and uh, continue to guide us with that as well. Just going to read through quickly here the, uh, the current prayer list. And I hope you guys are praying for this um, during the week. Um, we have um, Michaela and Joel's prayers uh, for the passing of uh, Michaela's grandfather. Um, uh, Richard uh, prays he's, uh, he's home from the hospital. Um, Nancy and her sister both have COVID. Let's keep them in our prayers for healing. Um, John T., uh, his friend who wants to know more about Jesus. Um, Boy, it's uh, something we all need to, uh, to work on, I guess. And people, that, people are asking. Boy, it's a good time to, to, to step up in faith and, do, and uh, let them know about the Lord. Uh, Mike T., uh, patience and peace while waiting for answers for health issues. Uh, pray for the Denisons for wisdom and guidance uh, regarding their house and returning to the Philippines. The Shield family, recovery and comfort. Lori E., upcoming extensive surgery. Um, his Vincent family, uh, God's power and, and presence. Uh, Pat B. prays she's off of oxygen and doing better. Praise the Lord. Uh, continue praying for her healing. Anthony, God's uh, palpable presence and prayer. Kevin and Katie, God's power and presence. Bennett family, uh, Ross's dad, continue prayers as he goes through uh, chemotherapy treatments. Um, Green Mountain Church, uh, Pastor John Bryant. It's a new 4C church in Chester, Vermont. Not Chichester, but Chester. Uh, the Forgotten Initiative. Um, like to lift up that ministry as well. TLC, uh, Protection and Provision from God. Our nation's uh, uh, leaders uh, that God would, would guide our nation. This is biblical to pray for our nation's leaders. Um, you know, we need to pray that the Lord would guide them, and that uh, we would have peace and the continued privilege of being able to worship freely in our country. Uh, it's something we should be in our daily prayers. Um, the Undercover Pantry, um, pray for the families that it's serving, um, you know, that um, we also love and provide for them that way, but we pray for their salvation as well. Um, Teachers, parents, and students uh, navigating the challenges of online education. Um, Wayne M. and Jack M. both are receiving cancer treatments. Let's keep them in our prayers. Uh, family and friends who don't yet know Christ as a Savior. Uh, we all have those, and uh, it's difficult to reach our own families. So let's, uh, let's keep praying. You know, prayer is an awesome tool. Um, to, to overcome some of these hurdles that uh, we just can't seem to come, overcome. 
uh, online uh, visitors, um, for you, those of you that are watching online, um, if you have any prayer requests, please send them to, um, I guess it's uh, office at uh, hicnh.com. And then, uh, I got that right, I guess. I got the nod. Um, Hope in Christ Church, uh, spiritual growth and purpose in our community. Um, is there anything that I missed? Is there anything else that... Uh, Okay. Um, so the Bible does tell us to pray without ceasing. Um, it just means that we should always be ready to pray at a moment's notice. And we do live in very dangerous times right now. Um, and it's, um, if there's ever been a time to pray, it's now. And we really need to pray hard as a church. You know, like those revivals that was, I spoke about earlier, um, they, were, they, were, they began with prayer. And as churches were praying, those revival sides. So we need to pray. We need to pray for our nation and, and our nation's leaders. Because, um, you know, prayer is basically, it's, it's our greatest weapon against adversity, um, you know, Satan's attacks, or whatever it is. So, you know, prayer is our best tool for that. So let's go. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for watching over us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for um, the ability, Lord, to, to read your word, to understand your word, and just get wisdom, Lord, um, for um, the decisions that we need to make, Lord, in life, and how we raise our families, and how we, we run our businesses. Lord, we pray, Lord, that we thank you, Lord, for that, that, for that, uh, that provision for us, Lord. And Heavenly Father, um, there's many, there are many uh, names on our prayer list today, Lord. Uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, you be with each one for, uh, for healings, Lord, that have uh, physical ailments, Lord, um, and also for any, um, any um, just the, the stresses in life, Lord, the, the ones that aren't physical healings, Lord, but, um, Lord, just watch over us, Lord. Help us to stay um, mentally and physically healthy, Lord, and spiritually healthy as a church, Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, for um, all of our um, ministries here at church. I pray, Lord, that you be with each one of us, all the leaders, Lord, and all those that are working to support that, Lord. Keep us, uh, keep us out of harm's way, Lord. Keep us uh, in your word, Lord, and strengthen us, Lord, as a church. And Heavenly Father, watch over our pastor and his family and the elders in his church. I pray, Lord, for your wisdom, guidance, and direction for them, Lord that uh, we may truly be um, marching in a direction, Lord, that you would have us go, Lord. And Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you, Lord, for your many blessings and for your grace and mercy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Don. Uh, good morning. Uh, in case you're wondering, I'm not Pastor Steve. <laughs> Pastor Steve and, and Shirley are on vacation this week. We, uh, it's well deserved. Hope that they're having a great week uh, and that he's able to get a little bit of rejuvenation as he's out in the woods um, and doing whatever else they've been doing this past week. I wanted to start this morning uh, just by mentioning the, the ladies group that's coming up soon uh, that will be learning and studying about spiritual gifts. Uh, it's a, it, the program that they're using is, uh, as a guide is Chip Ingram, and it's a, it's a wonderful program. We did that same study a number of years ago in the church. Uh, when I think it was even before we were in this building, so probably 15 years or more uh, ago. Uh, God promises in his word to give each of us spiritual gift at the time that we are reborn, and that that gift is chosen by him for us. Uh, it's different than giving us talents. They always work together. In harmony, uh, but it's a gift that that is a need for specific bodies, and that 
brings glory to God. Uh, and so we'll be praying for the women uh, that that don't know what their gifts are, because sometimes it's hard to discover and understand what your gift is, and sometimes it's easy. Uh, I know that uh, uh, my spiritual gifts, uh, which I've been aware of for many years, uh, are teaching, for one, and exhortation or encouragement. And one of the things that somebody told me many, many years ago, and I think it's very true, I've experienced it many times, is when you're using your spiritual gifts, it's like your sails are full. You know, you're, you're just sailing along and the sails are full and everything is going well. Uh, you may notice that uh, one of my gifts is not preaching. And there's a, a saying for that. I remember what it is. It's too bad for you. <laughs> uh, but the message that I have this morning really comes out of my spiritual gifts. It's really a message of encouragement mixed in with a little bit of instruction. So it's funny how that works. There's my two gifts. Uh, it's been on my heart for some time with all the different changes that are going on in, in our country and in the world uh, of how to keep that from impacting myself and my family and those around me in a negative way. How can I continue on in, in a positive, joyful way with all that's occurring around me? And so, uh, it's really been in my heart and God's been showing me and teaching me and I want to share some of that with you this morning. So the message this morning is not what a typical message is, which is to take a passage of scripture and open it up and unpack it and teach through it, uh, as Pastor Steve has been doing and he's very gifted at doing that. Um, but the message this morning is really more of a reminder and an encouragement, first of all, that things are no different for us than they were for people a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago. When we look at scripture and we look at the context of scripture, we see that people were in difficult circumstances with the environment and the world around them just as we are today. So God has a way that we can live, as his word says, as foreigners in the world because we're citizens of the kingdom. And we can live in a way that is full of joy and that is secure and that is peaceful in spite of what is going on around us. So keep that in context, if you will, as we share this morning. Because I'm going to kind of uh, skip around a little bit and, and, uh, and, and talk about various different things that God has put on my heart. First of all, I want to just mention the scripture from Matthew 7, 24 to 27. It's a very familiar scripture to most of us, and it's about what Jesus talks about, the house that's built on the rock. And what he says is, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains come, the streams rose, the wind blows and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had a foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rains come down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. So notice the difference between the wise man and the foolish man. First of all, they both heard God's word, but the difference between building the house on the rock and building the house on the stand, and one that will stand and one that will fall, is putting into practice what they heard. One didn't, and he was the foolish man, and one did, and he was the wise man. I want to be like that wise man that built his house on the rock. And I know you want to be like the wise man that built his house on the rock. And so we need to hear God's word 
and we need to practice. Listen to what Proverbs 24.3 says about how a house is built. The house needs to be built, but I think, what is it, Lord, that it takes to build that house? Well, we know it takes practice of, of God's word, Jesus told us. But in Proverbs 24, we see that wisdom is what builds a house. And through understanding, it's established. So the house is built with wisdom, but it's established through understanding. And then it's furnished. Do you, do you know that scripture tells us how the house is furnished? It's furnished by knowledge. And the furnishings that come by knowledge are rare and beautiful treasures. They're not old furniture that somebody gives to us or that we've, we've had for years and years but the rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Sounds really great, doesn't it? I want to live in that house, and I want to weather the storms when they come, because Jesus said they will come, and I want to build my house on the rock. And God gives us the tools to do that. I want to share a story this morning. Uh, a lot of you know that my career has been as a professional pilot, and I, I don't like to always talk about that, but I, I use it frequently from the pulpit because, not because I want the message to be about me, but because God has shown me over the years many, many things. I've been flying professionally for 52 years. It's hard for me to believe that. I don't even feel 52 years old, but, but he's shown me many, many things that are parallel to his word, and that are good examples of his word. And so this morning I want to share one of those to set the stage for, for the rest of what I have to share with you. And, and part of my career, uh, I worked at a major airline and I was a pilot at, at the airline, but I also worked in the training department. Now I know probably some of you are sitting there thinking, why do you have a training department with an airline? Hopefully by the time a guy gets to fly an airliner, he doesn't need any training. But that's not the case. The, the airlines and the professional trainers realized a long time ago, they really took a page out of scripture from James, uh, that pilots need to go back and get retrained every year and recertified every year. It's the only profession I know of that, that requires each one to get recertified every year. And if you don't get re your recertification, then you lose the privilege to fly, you lose your license. And so I worked in the training department as well as the flying. Again, God using the gifts that he's given to me uh, or using them uh, for purpose. Uh, and one of the things that we did in the training department is that we needed to study the NTSB accident reports for airplanes. It was not a real pleasant thing to do if you're a pilot. That's not something you want to be looking at, you know, is why a particular airplane crashed or why there was an accident. But there was a purpose for that, and the purpose was that we could understand what caused the accidents, and we could learn from them, and we could teach the pilots in the recurrent training. Many procedures over the years were changed because of things that were learned in accidents. So I, I want to share with you uh, an accident that makes a point this morning for the message. So if you put the first slide on, please. And, and uh, this is about an Eastern Airlines L-1011, which was a wide-bodied airplane in the, in the 70s. It carried about 250 or 300 people. Um, the airplanes back at that time, many of them had three crew members instead of two in the cockpit. This airplane had three crew members. It also had a fourth pilot that was not acting as a crew member, but he was riding up in the cockpit. There's two extra seats up there uh, for pilots to, to travel back and forth. Uh, he was qualified on the airplane, but he was not acting as a crew member. So there were four qualified pilots up in the cockpit. Uh, the flight was out of Miami, Florida, and it was a nighttime flight, and it was an overcast. About 10,000 feet, there was an overcast. So you couldn't see, if you're below 10,000 feet, you couldn't see any stars. Uh, and you had no indication of the horizon. When the airplane was on the final approach for landing, uh, typically the landing gear, the wheels, are put down at about three miles out from the touchdown. 
And uh, when the wheels go down, and it's always a good idea to put them down because it makes it much easier to taxi after you land. You can taxi into the terminal a lot easier. But uh, once you put them down, there's no way you can see them from the cockpit. Can't even, in many airplanes, commercial airplanes, you can't even see the wings. They're far enough back. So there's three lights up in the cockpit. You put the landing gear handle down. You'll feel the landing gear usually come out. If you've ever ridden in a, as a passenger in an airplane, you'll feel that. You can hear the noise. Uh, but then you get bing, 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 in theory, three green lights, one for each gear, one for the nose gear, one for the left main gear, and one for the right main gear. So the crew was, everything was fine. They put the wheels down, and they only got two green lights. So when you're only three miles away from the runway, the threshold of the runway, and you're at that point probably doing 150 or 160 miles an hour, it doesn't take you long to get travel those three miles. So you don't want to be trying to figure out what's going on while you're still continuing for your landing. So they did what a normal procedure was. They talked to the control tower, told them they had a problem, and they wanted to go up and just figure out what the problem was. Uh, and so they asked the control tower to direct them to a point that was away from the other traffic so they wouldn't be a problem. So the tower from Miami vectored them to a point, uh, a fix that they gave them, which was out over the Everglades, which is not really very far from the airport at Miami, especially at that time. And, uh, and they told them to climb to 3,000 feet, which is not real high, but it's plenty, plenty high and safe for an airplane like that. And the crew put the airplane into a holding pattern to put the autopilot on. So now the airplane is out over the Everglades, uh, and because it's over the Everglades, there's no lights down there like there would normally be over a city, so there's no lights down there, and they're underneath that 10,000-foot overcast, so there's no lights up in the sky. There's no stars. And they proceeded to try and figure out what the problem was. Now there's four qualified crew members in the airplane, the airplane is doing a holding pattern, which is like a racetrack, and it's coming back to that same fix. And while they were all trying to figure out what this problem was with the landing gear, one of them had gotten out the manual, and he was looking in the manual and trying to find the section on the landing gear. The others were talking about it. One of the pilots inadvertently clicked off the autopilot button. There's a switch to put the autopilot on. And at that time, there was no warnings if as a result, a direct result of this accident, uh, the airplanes were modified once they realized what had happened so that any time an autopilot is selected off uh, that you get an oral warning. So just if I don't want anybody to be afraid to go flying again and think, gee, somebody's <laughs> going to kick off the autopilot. But they didn't have that at this time. So now the airplane is, is flying along and out the cockpit windows is just black. There's no lights on the ground. There's no lights in the air. And all four guys are diverting their attention to what the problem is. And the airplane started a slow descent. And <clears throat> nobody realized that it was just a gentle descent because it wasn't being controlled. And it crashed into the swamp and everybody died. The NTSB on their investigation, and of course they get a lot of detail uh, from flight recorders and they studied all the tapes of what was said in the cockpit, which is always recorded, etc., and the procedures, uh, determined two things. Number one is that nobody was paying attention to flying the airplane. That was the primary cause of the accident, is that all four individuals were focused on the problem and nobody was paying attention to flying the airplane. The second thing that they discovered, which was really tragic, is that the problem with the landing gear wasn't a problem with the landing gear. One of the light bulbs had burned out. And so that really drove home some points uh, because Prior to that, there was a pattern developing that the NTSB was seeing with air aircraft and airline accidents, uh, and that was that when pilots were presented with a problem, an abnormal or an emergency situation, they were diverting their attention from flying the airplane to focusing and correcting the problem. Now, it, it kind of seems like common sense that you would fly the airplane first, doesn't it? You know, 
in retrospect, it's easy to think that. But it kept showing up over and over in accident reports. And what they discovered is that it's our nature that when something is wrong that we put our focus on it and we lose our focus on what's going on around us. We divert that focus to the problem and fundamentals go out the window. And our, our focus is on fixing the problem. What's the matter? Let's fix it. What's the matter? Let's fix it. When in fact, over and over it's been proven that there's more danger when you don't keep your primary focus, in this case, on the airplane or on the fundamentals. They've shown since then on many occasions that you can have an engine that's on fire or a severe problem and, and you've got plenty of time to deal with that, but you have to fly the airplane first. So as a result, there were many changes to training philosophies uh, and they, they really worked on teaching pilots they being the training people, the uh, teaching people, uh, to use all the tools that are available to them, all the tools that are available to them, and to stay focused on the fundamentals. And they came up with the love acronyms and sayings and all kinds of things. I could show you books from my training with literally hundreds and hundreds of acronyms. But basically what they did is, is uh, they said, fly the airplane first, fly the airplane first, and then evaluate the problem, and then communicate. And so when we would go into the simulator every year, part of our recurrent training is to go fly in a simulator, which is a very real compared to the airplane. It's, ex it's exceptionally accurate, feel as well as all the instrumentation and all. And we'd have one emergency after another. The very first thing that they would do is just say, the, the instructor in there would just say, remember, fly the airplane, fly the airplane, because your, your first response and reaction is something's wrong, something just happened. What is it that happened, and I need to fix it? And your attention would come off. So it was fly the airplane. They, they, learned, they taught us and developed a number of what they call memory items for each particular airplane that you were qualified in that we were had to memorize and were tested on each year so that if there were items that needed immediate attention that while we were flying the airplane we could make those changes and do those actions without having to look up in a book someplace so it it was up here and I've got to tell you that um, you know you go to school you learn all these things you learn it in depth you study it and and you go out and you fly, you're flying the airplane day in, day out, and you go a year and you haven't had any emergency or abnormal problems. You come back to the simulator and if you haven't studied, you've lost a whole bunch of that stuff. You might be able to muddle your way through, but go two years and now it's really starting to fade. So they required us to be tested on those memory items and we needed to know those. So what does all this have to do with the message this morning? Well, I want to take a look at a verse that's out of 1 Peter, I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. That to me, that second only to salvation is just in this passage itself is one of the richest and fullest and most meaningful promises that God gives to us. A little background on this, when Peter was writing this, he was writing to strengthen the church, the church in general, okay? Reminding and telling believers to be aware and keep our eyes on Christ, to remain focused, to know truth, and understanding just so that we can build our house with wisdom and understanding and knowledge. We can build it, we can establish it, and we can furnish it. He was warning the church about false teaching 
and about leaders that would twist the truth and lead people astray, just like is happening today. So I want to read this passage to you. But I'd like you to listen because I want to read it to you as if we're just talking one-on-one. If I was talking to you to try and encourage you, if you were discouraged and maybe even a little bit afraid about your personal circumstances or what's going on in the world or both and the combination and all that, listen to what God has to say and what Peter wrote. His divine power, God's divine power, has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. So... God, through his power, has given us, he's given you, and he's given me everything that we need. Everything that we need for life and for godliness. And what more is there? Everything that we need for life, he's given us. Everything we need for godliness, he's given us. And he's given it to us through our knowledge of him. Who called us by his own glory and goodness. And through these, and what... What Peter's referencing there is God's glory and his goodness. Through God's glory and goodness, he's given us his very great and very precious promises. These are promises. They're promises. So that through them, we can participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. What is the divine nature? Is God's nature, isn't it? And he has given us the promise that we can participate. Now on Sunday, if I'm watching a football game or a baseball game, I am not participating. I might like to participate, maybe more in a baseball game than football, but uh, I'm not participating. I'm watching. But God has promised us everything we need to participate and escape the corruptions of the world. I want that. Do you want that? I want that. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, how do we make a quality like godliness or brotherly kindness, how do we make it increase? By using it, by practicing it. So if we possess these qualities and we practice them so they increase in measure, they will keep us from being ineffective and unproductive of our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to have that knowledge because remember, it's through our knowledge in verse 3 that God has given us the power for everything we need for life and godliness. It's through knowledge. So they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure, because if you do these these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want that. Do you want that? I want that that welcome into the eternal kingdom. I want to be a participant in God's kingdom on the earth. I want to be set aside from the corruption that's in the world around us. I want everything that I need to be able to do that and for life. Again, it's no different today than it was then.
as we live on the house that's on the rock, that's built by wisdom and established by understanding and furnished with treasures, when the storms come, how do we do it? How do we do it when the storms come? Because, as you know, Jesus didn't say just in case or maybe, but he said when. Well, God gives us tools, and his tools are awesome. It's so easy to twist the truth when people have no understanding. And it's easy to be led astray when we have no understanding. But with God's tools, and when we practice, our understanding grows. So I want to take a look at those tools this morning. Um, first, I want to just say, what, what is a tool? There's a few things we need to know about tools. First of all, you need to know how to use them. Some of them are pretty basic. You think maybe, gee, a hammer. I don't think I need to know how to use a hammer. But think about when, if you have children or when you were a child, the first time you used a hammer, how do you hold it, how do you hold the nail, even a basic tool like that. We have to know how to use them. Some, of, some tools are very complex. Every tool has a power source. Sometimes the power source is me. But it could be electricity. It could be gasoline. Every tool has a power source. In order to use a tool well, you have to practice with it. The more you use it, the more skill you have with it. The better is the outcome and the easier the job becomes. When you're using a tool, you have to concentrate and focus. Anybody ever bang their, their thumb with a hammer? If you're, if you're using a hammer and nail and you're talking to somebody that comes into the room, what's the chances that you're gonna, number one, drive the nail properly, and number two, not damage the wood or whatever you're nailing it into, and number three, come away without a black spot on your thumb? And lastly, that uh, all tools require maintenance, even just basic maintenance. So we have to keep working at them. The most important thing about a tool, though, the most important thing is that you have to use it. You can have a garage full of tools. You can have a basement full of tools, a closet full of tools. They can be the most expensive, best tools in the trade or basic tools, it doesn't matter if you don't use it. It doesn't help, does it? You might have used it last week on a job, but if you don't go to it and use it again this week, it's not going to help. So all tools have something in common, and the, the most important thing is that you, you need to use them. So the first tool that I want to talk about, and see if I can do this. I see Pastor Steve do this all the time, and nothing happens, so if you would... Change to the next slide, please. The first one that we have, and if we're not able to change the slide, we can just turn that off. Let's see here. Oh, it's all right. Uh, the first tool is God's Word. Right here, God gives us his word to teach us who he is and to build our faith and trust as we walk with him. Now, that's not an all-encompassing statement for sure, but for the purposes this morning, God's word is the first tool. This is the fly the airplane part. It's a textbook for each of us. Thank you. It's a textbook for each of us as believers. He gives us truth. He gives us knowledge. He instructs us on how to build our faith and trust. He demonstrates our love for us, and he shares his desires and promises for us. This is what we need to be able to learn about God, what we need to grow in God, and what we use to live our daily lives with God. This is the fundamentals. This is where we study to begin with, 
and we keep going back and back and back. This is, is the fly the airplane. We always need to go to God's word. If something is contrary to God's word or not in God's word, it's not truth. Test all things in his word. No matter what, whatever problems we see, if, if it's an overall thing like what's going on in our country, in our world right now, or if it's a, in, in your own life individually, don't take your focus off of God's word. Remain in it. It's truth. It never changes. We need to read God's word. We need to focus on God's word. And we need to practice. That word comes up over and over in scripture. We need to practice what Jesus said. We need to practice those qualities that Peter talked about. We need to use the tool. If we don't, it's just like James says, we forget if we don't continually go back. We forget. And the tool is no longer effective. Now, one thing is that we are taught to hide God's word in our hearts. Deuteronomy 11.18 says, Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. It's good for us to learn scripture, to memorize. We don't need to memorize word for word. We need to, to memorize what God's word is saying to us. And we don't, some people say, oh, I can't, I can't get it word for word. You don't need it word for word. You need to understand it and put it in your heart. Why do we need to put God's word in our heart? so that they're there when we need them. Just like the memory items in the airplanes. If you're faced with a particular issue and you have God's word in your heart, first of all, no one can ever take that away and secondly, you can call on it. Right when you need it. You, may, you don't have to go back. You might not have time to go back to God's word. And if you don't, then you've got it right here until you do have time. This is the fundamentals. Remember that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. What? Through our knowledge of him. And knowledge comes from this. I want everything that I need for life and godliness. I need knowledge. The next tool that God gives us is his wisdom. God gives us wisdom to help us understand who he is and to increase our knowledge and understanding. So when the storms, when the, when the rain is coming and the stream is rising and the wind is blowing and beating against your house and you've maintained your course, You've kept your fundamentals. You've kept your eye on, on God's word first in the focus. What we need to do is not rely on our own understanding, but rely on God's understanding. What is happening to us? What would he have us do in this circumstance? How would he have me live my life? How would he have me respond to that person that said something that was offensive to me? How would he have me maintain my integrity in my work environment? What is it that he would have me to do? How would he have me apply what's in here to this situation that I'm living now? This is the evaluate part. You fly the airplane, and when you're sure that you're still under control, you now begin to evaluate. We need to have God's wisdom. Scripture is really full of teaching about God's wisdom. There is a lot of instruction in, in teaching about God's wisdom. Proverbs 8.22 says, God brought forth wisdom as the first of his works before his creation. Is that a, is that a cool thought? I, you know, when I read that, I think, you know, 
God used wisdom, which makes sense in my, my small brain, that I can't see what he can. He, wisdom had to be there first as part of his creation. And, and so God brought forth wisdom as the first part of his works before creation. It was by wisdom the Lord laid the earth's foundations. And it was by understanding that he set the heavens in place and by his knowledge that the deeps were divided and he let the, the clouds drop the dew. Isn't that interesting? Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge that the Lord used and, and that's what we're told is to build our house. We build the house with wisdom, we establish it with understanding and we furnish it with knowledge. God did the same thing first. That's from Proverbs 3, 19 and 20. To the discerning, all of God's wisdom is faultless, Proverbs 8 and 9. If we rely on our own wisdom, we cannot understand. But if we rely on God's, it is faultless. The value of wisdom, I'm going to take a minute to read because we still have time, from Proverbs chapter 3. A little bit about wisdom. If you want to learn about wisdom, read through Proverbs over and over. It's not exclusive, but read through. There's a lot about wisdom. Listen to this and see if it's something that you want. I know it's something I want. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. Wisdom is, is better than silver or gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Nothing. Wisdom is that important and is that valuable. Long life is in her hand, in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways. In all her paths are peace. Do you want it? I want it. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. Will be blessed. Not might be, but will be blessed. I want this wisdom just like I want that house on the rock and just like I want everything I need for godliness in life. So how do I get God's wisdom? I ask for it. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. James 1.5 1, Is it unconditional? No, it's not unconditional. There's one condition. We must believe that God will give it to us. He doesn't want us to waver back and forth. He doesn't want us to ask for his wisdom in a circumstance and his understanding. And when he gives it to us, we step back and say with our brains, but, but this or but that, this doesn't line up with what I'm thinking or whatever. He wants us to trust him. God's wisdom gives us understanding and discernment that we need in our circumstances to live life. But let's be clear about one thing. God does not have an obligation to show us the why of our circumstances. He doesn't owe us any reason of why. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, Isaiah 55, 9. We don't understand his ways. His wisdom is about what and how. What does he want us to do and how does he want us to do it? So go to God, ask for his wisdom, expect him to give it to you. And so how do you know that you've got it? Which brings us to the third tool, and that's his Holy Spirit. This is the communicate part. Fly the airplane. Stay on course, make sure everything is under control with the fundamentals. Evaluate the problem, ask for God's wisdom. What do I do? How do I do it? And now communicate. 
with the pilots and crew. It's going to be communicate with each other, but it's also going to be picking up the microphone and talking to the people on the ground and getting help from on the ground. God gives us his Holy Spirit to know truth and to lead us and guide us to walk closer with him. Now, certainly this, again, is not all-encompassing definition of why God gives us his Holy Spirit. And we could do a study for weeks about God's Holy Spirit. But what we need to know this morning is that God's Spirit is living in us. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. Right there he called the Holy Spirit two different things, the Counselor and the Spirit of Truth. The world can't accept him because they can't see him and they don't know him. But you know him, for he lives with you and he will be in you. That's from John 14. Jesus promised that when he left, he would send the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. The Holy Spirit was sent for us, and he lives in us. And his purpose is many, but among the purposes that that the Holy Spirit has for us is to lead us and direct us, Acts 8.29, to guide us, to lead us into all truth, to give us counsel, and to speak to us. So here we are again. The rains come. The streams rising, the winds blowing and beating against the house. We are abiding in Christ, John 15. That's staying in the word. We're staying in God's word, James 1. Our focus is correct. We've asked God for his wisdom. What should we do and how should we do it? So we're evaluating and we're we're using his wisdom. But how do we know that we know that we know? We communicate with God. We communicate with God through his Holy Spirit. We ask the Holy Spirit to show us his truth, to direct our path, to guide us in our actions, to speak to us and to counsel us. So we ask. But communication is a two-way street. We have to listen. How often do we talk to God one way? So we ask the Holy Spirit, and then we listen. He will speak to us. Our Father will speak to us through his Spirit. And so our tools, God's Word, fundamentals, never leave the fundamentals. Never. His wisdom, which he promises to give us unconditionally as long as we believe. And his Holy Spirit to counsel us and direct our path and lead us in truth. So when we're using all of these tools, these awesome tools that God has given us, now we can act on his word and with his wisdom and by his guidance. And so when we see around us all that's taking place or where our life seems to be folding in on us and difficult, use the tools that God gives us. Don't be afraid. Don't let Satan control your world. Don't be afraid. Look for truth. Don't be manipulated. Don't be led astray. It's easy to be led astray with subtle directions. And don't take your eyes off of God's word. Very important that we learn not to rely on ourselves in this process. What is our responsibility? My responsibility is to be in God's word, to be seeking his wisdom and guidance through the Holy Spirit. But I want to empty myself as best I can from my flesh and become an empty vessel and bear before him. We want to do that so that he can speak clearly, so that we can hear clearly 
and that we can act in obedience to God's direction and leading. Now we're operating in God's realm. All we need for the divine nature, right? And for life. Everything that we need for life. One way that helps me to do this, and I will close with this, is to help me to get empty is Psalm 139. Not there enough. But I would, I would encourage you, get on your knees by yourself before the Lord and just pray this Psalm 139. Search me, O God, it's familiar, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive ways in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And then listen. Don't forget to listen. So, in closing, remember, fly the airplane. Evaluate the problem. And communicate God's word, God's wisdom, and his Holy Spirit. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we thank you uh, that you have given us everything that we need, everything you have said, Lord, everything for life and godliness and how we can participate. Lord, we don't have to be spiritual. We don't have to be super smart or anything else. We just have to be obedient and in your word and trusting you abiding in you, Lord, and not being afraid. We pray, Lord, that you would give us strength and truth, each one of us, where we need it most, where only you can know. Father, that we would not be afraid of truth before you, and that we would not be afraid to act. And Father, We praise you for your love. We praise you that you have given us access to living our lives in peace, in the midst of turmoil, and in trusting you and knowing that we can spend eternity forever and ever with you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you're dismissed.